If you would, grab your Bible. Let's open the Word of God. We're going to turn to Luke, Luke chapter 14 today. Luke chapter 14. We're going to begin in verse number 1 here in just a moment. I want to thank... uh, all those that were able to help uh, the uh, Loudon family uh, this week and um, just uh, trying to make uh, their week more comfortable. And um, the church uh, always sends uh, flowers, those kinds of things, uh, to the funeral. Then we typically always try to uh, feed the family if, it's, if we're able to do that. And we don't have a place to offer uh, people right now, but uh, we will. And uh, so it made it a little bit more difficult to do it this time. And they have a rather large family. And uh, those that were able to help with the food, I really appreciate your help. And uh, got a lot of comments about uh, uh, appreciation um, for the church and their love for uh, Miss Martha and Brother JC. Uh, they appreciated the food, was a great blessing. And um, so... Um, uh, some of you were able to go by the uh, funeral home, and uh, thank you for doing that. It, it's, it's a little, little more difficult to do that the way people do funerals anymore. Uh, people don't have two nights uh, or two days of uh, calling, you know, visitation. I know it makes it very difficult for those of you that work. Uh, you can't get off to go to things like you used to. And um, so uh, thank you for praying. I really felt like the Lord helped with the message there. Uh, that uh, that day also. Luke chapter 14, uh, verse number 1, and you find Christ here uh, in a situation where he's been apparently invited to a, a, a dinner at a house, and he's really not quite welcome there. The Pharisees have brought him there to examine him, to trip him up, to uh, cause trouble. And uh, so he's in a crowd of people that are less than enthusiastic. Matter of fact, they are uh, in many ways antagonistic of him and against him. They are enemies of his, and they're looking to cause difficulties to to him. And so, um, but in the course of this dinner, Christ heals a man. And then he has these three sections where he gives a parable or a thought or he gives a, a principle. And we're going to deal with two of these very quickly. And I want to slow down with the, the third section and deal with that a, a little bit more extensively. But this is uh, the table talk of the Lord. And um, uh, you, you maybe talk around your table. I, I encourage you to do that. And I'll say more about that in just a moment. But let's read the passage of Scripture and then pray again. It says that it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace. And he took him and healed him and let him go. And he answered them, saying, Which of you? shall have an ass or an ox fall into a pit, and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day. And they could not answer him again to these things. I want you to notice this, that he, as he's with them, they're watching him. And uh, it's not with uh, uh, eyes of devotion, it's with evil intent. And so let me pray, and uh, we'll move on forward through here. Father, we do thank you again, Lord, for your word. We thank you for how it speaks to our hearts today. I pray that you do a mighty work in us, Lord. Help us to see Christ today. Thank you, Lord, for the words that he speaks. Lord, words that will help us, words that will change us. And Lord, as we hear, give us hearts to hear, ears to hear. Help us to take in the word of God. Lord, let it change us, Lord. Let us respond in a right way. Help us, Lord, to always say yes to you, to submit to you, to obey you, Lord, to follow you wherever you lead us. And, Lord, we know that's the safe way, the right way, the blessed way, the happy way. 
and uh, do a work again in our hearts. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Here in this passage of Scripture, uh, you could almost say, I read, uh, took a phrase from something I'd read that, that Christ is uh, experiencing hostile hospitality, that uh, he's been invited, but it's not with a very charitable or hospitable heart that he's been invited to this place to have dinner with these people. Um, if there's anything that I know about hospitality or if there's any good that I do with uh, having people around me or in my home, a lot of that I learned from my mom years ago. Uh, my mom was uh, very good at uh, entertaining, uh, being hospitable to people, making sure that their needs are met when they come into our home. And uh, my mom's desire as a, as a young woman, as, a, as, as she began to have a family, uh, my mom's great desire was to have a family that was close. Uh, my mom always wanted us to sit down at a table in the evening. And uh, over the course of my uh, early years as a child, I, it, my mom and dad both had to work. And, and uh, my mom worked extra hard to try to, uh, as soon as she got off work, she'd race home and she'd prepare a meal in the evening, and one of her great joys was to set a table and to have food there and for us to sit down just for a few moments at a table, gather together, and so that, those are all my early memories uh, of us as a family. A lot of those uh, early member, memories are from us sitting around a table, and we would talk, and sometimes the talk would be silly, you know, uh, as kids, uh, funny things about school uh, just about uh, things that would happen in our life. And, and, uh, but sometimes there'd be serious things, questions that would be asked, things that would be answered where mom or dad would be, be dealing with those things. And so people have kind of phrased that thing as table talk, table talk, what, what's set around a table, a kind of an informal kind of thing, just talking, uh, maybe sharing things, enjoying each other, uh, talking sometimes about serious things. And this is the Lord's table talk from about verse number 1 all the way down to verse number 24. And he's talking to people that are not so joyous about him being there. And while they're watching him, there was a certain man that maybe was not a prized guest, but they, they brought in this man that had the drop seat. And uh, that has some thought that it may have been uh, some sort of uh, water issue, uh, kidneys, uh, uh, that... He was uh, swelling, and I'm not sure exactly what all that uh, pertained to, but it was a, a serious situation in his life, and there didn't seem to be any way to help this man. And Jesus uh, knew they were going to give him grief about uh, healing this man on the Sabbath day. And these people were cold-hearted, mean-hearted people. They, they didn't particularly want to help anybody, especially on a day that, that uh, typically what, there wasn't any work to be done. And Christ asked them, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they, you know, they couldn't answer anything. They remained silent. They're, I'm sure they were just boring a hole through the Lord with their eyes. And um, so he heals the man. He took the man, healed the man, and then he let him go. He sends him away, sends him away for the criticism that was fixing to come. And Christ asked them a question in verse number 5. He said, which of you, if you had an animal, something that you valued, something that you prized, uh, an ass or an ox or any kind of animal, and if that animal fell in a ditch, wouldn't you go and help that animal? And of course they would. That's, that's something that is allowed. And, but if they said anything, if they said yes, they were going to be have a great difficulty. They were defenseless, helpless to defend themselves. And if they would help an animal, why wouldn't they help a person? And so at the end of verse number 6, it, it says here that they could not answer him again to these things. They had no answer to get back to the Lord. And so he begins to deal with them about several things. And this was a very self-righteous group of people. In verse number 7, it says, He put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And so what he's talking about here is the, the seating arrangement in that, typical, in that day that would be typical. 
and there would be uh, couches, there would be reclining, they would eat reclining, they would kind of, it'd be half, kind of half laying down, it wouldn't be a seat like you and I would think of, and he said, when you get to these stations, these rooms, these couches, he said, some of you are elbowing your way, trying to get to the chief's the chief room, the chief seat, the place where there's lots of glory connected. There's always was a chief, a high seat, a, a, a place where the honored guests would sit. And he says, I think he's looking around. He's seeing these people. They're self-righteous. They all think they deserve the, the high place, the, the place that, uh, uh, of chiefest honor. It says in verse 9, it says, And he that bade thee and him, and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room, but when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher, then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee, for whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And so the first little table talk is about this thing of self-exaltation, this thing of self-promotion. Uh, everybody is rushing for the chief seat, and the Lord tells them, don't, don't choose the chief seat, choose the lowest seat. He said, you may choose the chief seat, and the person that's in charge of the dinner or the wedding or the banquet may come in and says, no, no, you don't belong there. i got somebody else I want to put there, so you need to leave. And so you got to have this walk of shame as you leave the chief seat, and then Probably all the other seats are taken. You're going to have to go to the lowest seat. He said, you're going to be embarrassed about that. He said, what you need to do is choose the lowest seat, and if he wants to raise you up, let him raise you up, and then you'll have honor amongst those as you walk to the chief seat. And so we understand that we are to humble ourselves before the Lord. We are to find the, the low place in life and allow God to lift us up. Promotion comes from the Lord. And so it says here in Galatians 6, it says, For if, any, if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And look, none of us have any claim on being something. We're, we're nothing outside of the Lord. It says in uh, Proverbs 11, 2, it says, When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. And so when he's talking here in this table talk to these people around these self-righteous self-promoting, self-exalting, uh, self-centered people. He says that uh, if you're going to exalt yourself, you're going to be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And he said in many places, he said that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And if you have any honor, let God bring it to you. Uh, don't break your arm uh, patting yourself on the back. Don't, don't, uh, promote, uh, don't promote yourself. Let God promote you. And so he deals with this first table talk about this thing of, of this self-exaltation. Look at verse number 12. He, he continues his talk with them at the table. And, you know, I don't know, you probably have heard this phrase before, that you learn a lot where you put your feet under the table at. There's something about breaking bread with somebody, something about that, that casual sort of interaction that's a very powerful teaching tool uh, you ought to use it with your children. Use it to teach them something around a table and uh, teach them how to eat at home so that they eat out in public. And uh, not just how to eat, but how to live their life. In verse number 12, it says, Then said he also to them that bade him. So he's continuing on. Uh, he said, There's another lesson you need to learn. He says, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends nor thy brethren, neither, neither thy kinsmen nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. So what he's saying here to these people, and he, he knows their hearts, he knows the way they are, he says, what you've done is that you're calling everybody to dinner that is that can help you. Your whole your whole desire in inviting people to your home is to get help from them. You want some kind of recompense. You want some kind of payment. You want you want to you want to make something out of this. It's all about connecting. It's all about getting back. He said the way you ought to do it really 
is to invite people that can do nothing for you. Invite people that are truly in need, that are truly hungry, people that can't provide for themselves. Invite people that, that you, you're not going to expect anything back. They can't do anything for you. That is truly a, a true-hearted venture to ask them to come. And so uh, they, they use their hospitality to seek something. Hospitality ought to be given. Charity ought to be given with no thought to get back uh, anything from the people you're trying to be charitable to. And so uh, God says that if you do it the right way, he says, I will repay you. You don't have to expect any payment for them, but he says that you'll get a payment in the resurrection. You know, there is a payday that is coming. There is a, a honoring that's coming, that's coming from the Lord. So he deals with uh, this self-exalting kind of group. He, he's dealing with these people that are seeking to get from other people. And then he launches into another section here after the comment of one of those people. In verse number 15, it says, And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed or happy is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now that sounds like a fairly innocent sort of statement that it would be a blessing to eat bread in the kingdom of God. It, it would be a blessed thing to be around in God's kingdom. But the whole bit of this thing is that these people are so selfish, so puffed up, so arrogant that there is a thought here that he's saying, if there's anybody that's going to be there, I'm going to be him. I'm going to be that person. And what a blessing it is that I'm such a, 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 a wonderful person that I'm going to be included in, this, in the kingdom of God. And so the Lord launches into what will be another parable here. And uh, let me just read. I'm going to read kind of a lengthy little passage here, and I'll explain some of what this means here. It says, Then said he, in verse number 16, unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say, and say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, <coughs> have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And so here's a, a, a little parable here, and it's not just talking about the way they are. He's talking about he's talking about his kingdom here, and he's talking about comparable that a supper he's making is the, the supper or the, the feast of the gospel. He's giving a great dinner for the soul. And he's saying here that people that reject or people that won't come, they're not rejecting just a meal. They're rejecting him. They're reject, they are rejecting the gospel. And so this, this man, this certain man would obviously be God that's made a supper. He's made available food for, for everyone that wants to come and says he bade many, not few. He, he invited many, many people. And so this great supper, uh, there's an invitation made. And then there's a second invitation, a second attempt. In verse number 17, it says, He sent a servant at supper time to say to them, Come, for all things are now ready. Now, in that world uh, that Christ is in at the time, uh, if there was a second invitation sent to someone uh, in that, that those Arab tribes, if you were invited a second time and you refused, that was a tremendous insult. It was like a slap in the face. And in some instances, uh, if you refused 
a dinner request like that, it would be like a declaration of war between your tribe to the person that uh, invited you to come. So it was a, it was a great uh, shame to, to not come when you've been invited to something like that. And so uh, there's a list <clears throat> of excuses, and these excuses tend to be the kind of excuses that people have today about why they won't come to the gospel, they won't come to God, they won't get involved with the things of the Lord. And the first one says that this man says that uh, he's bought some land. And so he's busy with his business. He's busy with uh, the things and the cares of this life. He's, he's involved himself in something. And look, everybody needs to make some money. Everybody needs to be involved in something like that. But not to the exclusion of God. Our lives ought to be God-centered, not business-centered. Our lives ought to be centered around the things of the Lord. And God understands. God knows that you need to make a living. He, he's, he's made this life in such a way that he gets that. And so this man says, I'm so busy, I can't come to this great feast that you made. And so what he's saying here is this, I'm too busy for the gospel. I'm too busy for God. I'm too busy to be involved in this. I, uh, I'm, I'm going to make an excuse. And what is said here, it's almost like a conspiracy. It says that with consent, they, they, with one consent, they began to make excuses. Like they all got together and said, hey, I'm not going and you're not going. And, and so they, they're shutting down this dinner. And so the second one is this, uh, in verse number 19, another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen. And so he's busy with a new purchase. He's, he's a very material person. And both these people, they, they seem to be saying they bought land or they bought these uh, animals sight unseen. It's like they've never tried them. They never saw them. Nobody, nobody really seems to do that, do they, the, to buy something without knowing anything about what you bought. And so this one says, I'm busy with business. The other one says, I'm busy with new purchases. I'm a, I'm a material kind of person. I, it's all about the stuff to me. And so then the third one says, and you, you say, I kind of understand this one, the excuse. Another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. And look, in the Bible days, there was some excuses for uh, things like a, a man that would marry a woman. Uh, in that first year of marriage, they, they were excused from military service. But they were not excused from these social functions. And what this guy is saying, I'm too busy with family. Now, you know, obviously we see some people that are neglectful of family. That's, that's wrong. To, to neglect family or to abuse family or to be absent from family, to treat family in a, in a, in a, in a way that is less than charitable. That, 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 is, a, that is wrong, but there's also uh, the way the pendulum can swing a certain way that family could be elevated where family is above God. I hope you understand this, that God, there's nothing, there ought to be nothing, business, property, things, sports, family, none of that gets above God. It ought to be in this order. It's, I've heard this since I was a kid. Jesus, others, yourself. Joy, J-O-Y. Jesus first. Jesus always first. Others second. Ourselves last. <clears throat> so, God is to be the center of a person's life, and he's, he's calling them on the carpet for this. He says, you've invited me to this dinner. Uh, I've got a captive audience. I'm going to tell you a few things. You, you can't answer me, and I'm going to just talk to you about your self-exaltation. I'm going to talk to you about your, your inhospitality, uh, how, how you, you do this to, to seek things. And I'm, I'm trying to talk to you about how you've rejected the dinner that I provided. And in verse number 21, it says that the Lord... Uh, of the servant, the master, that he's, he's angry. He's angry that they reject uh, his son. Uh, they're ang he's angry that they, they, they reject uh, uh, the chance to come to the dinner. I want you to think about this, the, what God did to provide the dinner of the gospel for mankind. If, if uh, we were going to throw a big dinner on this property, and let's say we were going to invite every person in the city to this property for a meal. Man, it would take a lot of work. It would take a lot of planning. take a lot of forethought. It would take a lot of money to feed everybody. It, it would have to be done with great expense, great effort, great time. And so God put a lot of effort 
and time. He put a lot of, uh, uh, he put his own blood into this. He, he gave his own son. And so he purchased a, the meal of the gospel at great expense for all of mankind. And so there, there is an anger that he has that they're rejecting the, the bread, the meat, the water, the, the feast of the gospel that's been made available. And so um, he, he begins to tell his servant, I want you to go out and bid those in a farther area, those that, that need to come. He says, I want you to go out in the highways, uh, in the lanes of the city, the streets of the city. I want you to invite those that normally you wouldn't even think to invite. Invite the, the poor, invite the maimed, invite the halt, invite the blind. And so there's a thought here. I want you to, I want you to get this nailed down in your mind that there are going to be some people that are going to reject the gospel, yes, but God's plan will not be halted. God is going to go forward. We've been living in a, the last year of, uh, of this kind of slowdown of society, a shutdown of businesses and churches and uh, uh, a distancing away from every, everybody. But you know what? God's work is still going forward. I, I can't explain it sometimes, but God's work is, is not going to be stopped. And he says to the servant, he said, I want you to go out, and I want you to go out quickly. I want you to do it now. Uh, and then the, the servant goes out, and he says in verse 22, he says, Lord, it's done. As thou hast commanded, I've done it. And he says this. This is a wonderful phrase. He says, yet there is room Yet there is room. If you underline things in your Bible, you might underline that. Yet there is room. Now, many of us on this property today, we'd say, I'm saved. I'm born again. Uh, I can look back in my life. There was a time that I trusted Christ as my Savior. There was a time that I recognized that I was a sinner. I knew that I was going to go to hell. I, I didn't want to go to hell. I wanted my sins forgiven. I knew that there was nothing I could do about it. I knew that, that I needed to look to Christ Christ had already done the work on the cross. He'd taken my place. And I looked to him, and he saved my soul. And I got in. I'm glad I got in. I'm glad I got saved. I'm glad I don't have to go to hell. I'm glad that I have a home in heaven waiting for me. I'm glad that my sins rode away that day, and I don't feel guilty, and I have no guilt on me. I'm a saved person. No longer is God considering me a sinner. Now he considers me a saint. I have, a, I have a home in heaven. I have a, an inheritance waiting for me. I have a new family relationship. I have intimacy and a personal relationship with God himself. And so I got a lot that day. And my family is saved. And some of my grandchildren have been saved. But yet there is room for more people to come. There's room for your family, room for your friends God doesn't shut, shut the door. He doesn't say, hey, there's no more room. There's no more place. I, I've got too many in here right now. He doesn't say that. He says, there's room for more. There's room for more. Come, come in, come in, come in, he says. Yet there is room. And so I'm glad that God's plan has more room. And God's plan involves the servants going out. He tells the servant in verse Number 23, the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Well, I'll tell you, it's a wonderful thing that God tells this servant. He says, I want you to double the effort. I want you to go beyond. Go beyond. Go beyond the self-satisfied. Go to those that recognize their need. Go to those that know that they're maimed. Go to those that are spiritually blind. Go to those that are spiritually halt. Find those people. And look, there's, you're, you're going to find people, and we're going to find people that recognize that they need to be clothed, spiritually speaking. We're going to find people that know that they need to be carried, spiritually speaking, to God. We know that uh, we're going to find that there are people that know that they need to be guided uh, on this path. But, you know, God's plan still involves some difficulty. There are some people that are full of self-pity, and they're not going to come to God. There are some that are full of pride, and they won't come to God. There are some that are, that are unconcerned, and they're not going to come to God. There are some that are bitter, some that are angry. And among all these needy, they know they need God, but they won't come to God. 
what do we do? We keep going and going and going and going. It says to compel them to come then, to compel them. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 11, it says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We don't force people. We don't, we don't push people, but we compel people. We persuade people. Christ said in John 7, 37, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And that's what we're offering today. We're offering a drink of water to the soul. We're, we're offering food for the soul. There's a great feast of the gospel to be had even today. God's plan involves the rejectors being excluded. And that's a sad verse in, in verse number 24. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden, those that rejected, those that turned away, those that thought they are bigger than God, those that are bitter against God. He says, those people that were bidden, shall, they, they shall not taste of my supper. None of them were going to taste of his supper, the rejectors. You know, they had a free choice in that, though. It's been said that the free will of man is the most marvelous of the, of the Creator's gifts. God gave you the ability to choose. God's made salvation available to every man, every woman, every child. It's available to those that want it, those that see the need of it. And it's within your wheelhouse that God and His ability gave you the ability to say yes to it. And a long time ago, I said yes to it. But there are people that still say no to it. I don't understand it. God's done all the work. God's paid the full price. God's went to great lengths. He's literally moved heaven and earth to bring salvation to every man. He did a great work bringing His Bible to mankind that we could read it. And there's still people that are going to turn away. And so God's plan involves rejecting those that reject Him. Sometimes we try to value uh, sin. We try to say this sin is worse than any other sin, and this sin is worse, and obviously some sins have greater consequences, but the sin that will send you to hell is this, the rejection of Christ. It's all about this. What are you doing with Christ? And many of you say, I've trusted Christ as my Savior. But if you're sitting at the table today and you've tasted and you've eaten at the feast, Jesus Christ is sitting at that table also. He's telling you to, to, to allow yourself to be a humble person, a hospitable person, Allow yourself to be the servant that goes out and compels others to come in because some people are not sitting at the table yet and some of them have not tasted of the gospel. May God help us today to bring people to that place where they're ready to eat, but they're hungry. There are people that are hungry, you understand? Today there are people that are hungry for the Word of God, but they don't have anybody to help them. May God help us in the day that we live, the moment that we have right now, to be bold with the gospel, to be bold with the truth, and let's see other people come and sit at the table with us. They'd be part of the family. Their soul would be filled. There's yet more room. There's room at the table. And the Lord wants, wants His house filled. He wants it filled. Let's do the bidding of our Lord today. Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. Let me encourage you when we do this that you'd help your children, help them to understand the seriousness of the things. And I know, I know you got a big task there with the kids in the car, but help them to understand that God wants to speak to them also. Father, I pray that you'd help us today. Oh, God, thank you for the salvation that many of us have tasted. Lord, we've drank of the water, the water of life that was given freely. Thank you, Lord, for that the people that brought it to us, the people that worked tirelessly, some of them to help us to understand salvation. Thank you for that. But Lord, help us not to, to rest there. Help us to understand that there's yet more room. Lord, that there's a job for us to do to compel others to come in. Help us to be busy, Lord. Help us, help us to work and extend our reach. Help us to double down on the effort, Lord, that it's going to take. Help us not to get discouraged, Father. 
when people say no. And Lord, encourage us when people say yes. Help us, Lord, to love people to Christ. Help us to compel them to come in. Help us to persuade men, knowing the terror of the Lord ourself. Help us to disciple and train. Help us to give and go. Help us, Lord, to build and labor. And we'll thank you for what you do. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your patience today. Thank you for listening so well. And um, let's do a great work for the Lord this week. And a great work sometimes is just a faithful work. And um, continue to pray for those that are needy. And uh, I'm, getting, I'm hearing good things, good reports about Kim and the babies. And uh, uh, they need to just eat a little bit more, put on some weight. And um, But they're doing well. Kim's doing well. And uh, I know JC would probably enjoy a card or uh, a call to encourage him, and uh, his life's very different now, and I know some of you get that. So God bless you. Have a great day. We're going to be back in the, the parking lot today, today at 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock. God bless you. I hope to see you then.